I want to start with a short reminder of what we actually learned at the end of last lecture. Um, we were looking into image recognition and the particular test case is a very famous and important one to recognize digits, handwritten digits. And so we said how this is done in principle that you would construct a neural network that takes as input an image and it outputs um, several different neurons, each of which corresponds to one particular digit. So if it recognizes the digit number three, then the neuron that belongs to digit number three will fire. And so we learned several different things like one hot encoding and categorical cross entropy as a cost function. But in the end, when we implemented it, uh, we stumbled upon uh, some interesting behavior. So um, these are some images of digits where the network actually misclassifies them. And if we count for the experiment, the numerical experiment that we have been doing here, how many are misclassified, then it was about 77%. And that was in spite of the fact that it seemed like the accuracy during training uh, is very, very good and you seem to have only 3% error on the training samples. And so that was a little bit of a mystery which is resolved by recognizing that you have to be very honest in assessing how good you're doing. And if you only assess the quality on the training examples where you already train the network on, then this is not giving you uh, a fair assessment of the quality of the network. So what people do, again we discussed this last time and it's summarized again here, is they have a training set on which they train the network and then they have a validation set which the network never sees for the training, it's never trained on, but you can always use this to assess the accuracy of the network during training and then you can see how it's getting better and better. And then independent of that, there are the images to which it will uh, be applied finally or which form the test set, so that's completely independent of everything. Okay. And so if you adopt this, if you have a validation set on which you do not train, then you see this interesting behavior that is shown here. The accuracy on the training data may increase, increase, increase over time as you train more and more on these training samples. But the accuracy on the validation data may actually level off at a much lower value and it might even decrease again. It's not so easily visible here, but I indicated it by the arrow. And that's of course bad, so you are training more and more, but the accuracy on the validation data even decreases. So what's going on is the question. And so what, what's going on is known, uh, is known uh, as the phenomenon of overfitting. So what really happens is basically the network memorizes these training examples. You've shown these training examples again and again and again to the network and so at some point it really knows, oh, this picture where the pixels are arranged in exactly precisely this order, that's the three, because I learned it, because someone told me many, many times that this picture must be labeled three. But that doesn't mean that it can generalize to other pictures of three that look a little bit different because the pixels are in a slightly different shape. So that's really bad. It's like a student who doesn't know what they are doing <laughs> and just memorizes something and then if you ask a new question, they cannot answer. Yeah. So, um, well, the solution is first of all to always have this honest assessment of the accuracy by measuring it against the validation data which the network is not being trained on. And then you would do this, that um, you stop the training after the validation accuracy has reached its maximum because after that things are only getting worse. After that the network is only memorizing the training data. So you stop when when this is best. Um, you can also try to get more samples, of course. It always helps to get more training examples. And uh, if you don't have available more training examples, you can try to generate more. W I will show this in a moment, an example. But the idea is you could take an image, rotate it a little bit, uh, stretch it a little bit, and uh, you're sure that the label should still be the same because a rotated three should still count as a three. And so in this way, you can generate new training data. And then finally, there's a very valuable strategy that was only introduced relatively recently, and it's called uh, dropout. So what dropout means is that during training, you set to zero randomly some neuron values. So you introduce noise into the network. 
and that, preve that actually prevents nicely the network from purely memorizing the precise values of pixels because it cannot be sensitive anymore to precise values because it's always affected by the noise. So the only features it will still remain sensitive to are more uh, robust, rough overall features and that actually helps against, uh, against the overfitting. So that's, that's an interesting observation in general that the noise here helps. And so this is an example of how dropout helps us. So um, what we did here is to introduce dropout of 10%. So during any pass uh, through the network, randomly in this layer, you set 10% of the neuron values simply to zero, huh? or 10% of the connections to zero. And so um, that introduces the noise that we need. And uh, what you see here is that the accuracy on the validation data still does not reach the one on the training data, but at least it uh, levels off and it doesn't go down again. And I should also point out, even though these curves look similar to the ones we have seen before, that the numbers are actually much better. So here you are reaching 96 or 97 percent accuracy on the validation data. So there are only three percent mistakes um, on the validation data or on the independent test data. So, so things have really improved thanks to the dropout. So you add noise and things get better. Uh, that's probably also true if you train students. Um, so, for example, if you train them on, um, I don't know, doing mathematics, then it might be uh, reasonable to try to change the symbols relatively often because then they understand, okay, it's not these precise uh, labels, these precise symbols that matter, it's more the structure of the equations that matters. So that's a human example where a little bit of noise might help. Okay. And then uh, there's this example that I mentioned, the other technique of generating new data. Um, if your labels uh, are independent under geometric deformations of the picture, and that's quite often the case, uh, then you can adopt this. So for our handwritten digits, you can take this picture of the nine, you can scale it up, you can rotate it, you can move it around. Th you know that the label should always remain the same. And this is, of course, more generally true. If you have a picture of a cat and you rotate it a little bit, it is still a picture of a cat. Okay, fine. And so, of course, computer scientists have investigated very much the performance of, sh of such um, image classification tasks, and in particular of this very famous MNIST uh, handwritten digits classification task. And so I found this very nice... Uh, database um, on this website where different machine learning methods were compared for this particular MNIST example. And the simplest one you can do is a linear classifier. So basically you have only a single layer. You have the input and then immediately there's the output and then you try to classify uh, what digit it was. And uh, what is plotted on the right uh, is the error rate. Well, it's 12 percent. Uh, that seems high, but it's also a very, very simple solution. Huh? So input goes directly to output, and then you decide uh, if the neuron value is above some threshold, uh, you say, okay, that counts as digit number three. Huh? Okay, and then there are various uh, multi-layer networks with different numbers of hidden neurons. Here you see, for example, going from 300 to 800 in this example reduces the error rate. Um, you can also sometimes do some interesting pre-processing. Maybe you see that the digit is distorted, but maybe you have a, a simple way of uh, undoing the distortion. Uh, so, so that's not that's something that you put in by hand. It's not something that the neural network learns. Um, these are examples where um, you have augmented the training data set by distorted images. Um, and then there are examples of so-called convolutional networks. And so these are the state of the art. And that also means that I will now discuss uh, convolutional networks. Okay. But um, next week there will actually be a tutorial and uh, you will go through many different examples. Um, and among them is if you take this MNIST example and modify it a little bit, uh, what happens? So, for example, um, uh, how well does it do if you add a little bit of noise to the images? 
or if you cut out one part of the image, and that sounds like a real application because maybe for some reason <laughs> there's dirt on the on the postal code on your letter. Um, and you could either use the network that was trained on the nice uh, digits and see how how it performs. Of course, the performance will go down if you add the noise. Or you could uh, explicitly train the network on such noisy images. Yeah, you you know still that the label here should be a number six, um, but there is noise, so you can try to train the network to be insensitive to the noise, and it will be become a little bit better because you train it on such uh, examples. Um, the other thing that you might want to try yourself is um, to generate pictures on your own. For example, you can uh, produce a pixel image that uh, represents a circle or a square placed here or there, larger or smaller, and then you can uh, build your own classification task. You, for example, the network has to distinguish the circle against the square, or maybe it has uh, not to classify something, but uh, you want it to figure out what's the area of the circle, and that should be the result that the network gives you when you present it with a picture of a circle, for example. Yeah? So you can uh, cook up on your own many, many interesting uh, tasks of image recognition, uh, either by attaching discrete labels yourself or by asking things like, uh, what's the size of the square, and so on. Okay. But now I want to switch to convolutional networks. And this is really important and it's also very nice because it's very much connected to a lot uh, in physics. So convolutional networks take their name from the mathematical operation of a convolution, and I will remind you in a moment of what this really means. But uh, their application domain is that they are very good if you have translational invariants, as we have in this example. Yeah? So this is an image of the digit 9, and even if the digit 9 has been shifted a little bit to another part of the image, it is still uh, the digit 9, yeah? so the label should be the same. And these convolutional networks are very good in exploiting this fact that uh, you have this translational invariance and they need much less memory and are very powerful. So they are really the state of the art for image recognition. Okay. But now I remind uh, um, what convolutions are about. Um, if you paid attention and you're mathematics or physics courses, you know this. Um, assume I have some function f of x, and now I do this operation, where basically at any given new coordinate x, I pick up contributions from a lot of other coordinates x prime of the values of f. And these contributions will be weighted by something that is called a kernel. Okay. And this kernel only depends on the difference of coordinates. That's where the translational invariance enters. So uh, um, I can draw the picture here, um, so to speak. Uh, the around each um, coordinate, around each point x prime, there's a zone of influence that depends on how fast the kernel falls off, and then it will. Uh, contribute in this convolution operation uh, to the new value at position x. If the kernel ha is not yet completely zero, it will contribute. And if, it's if x and x prime are closer to each other and the kernel is larger, then it will contribute more. Okay. And so um, in physics, we encounter this again and again and again. So for example, whenever you have linear partial differential equations, think of the wave equation or diffusion equation, and you want to solve them. You want to say, I started out with uh, a wave profile at time zero or a temperature profile at time zero. I want to know what is the wave profile at some later time. Then you can calculate what is known as the Green's function. The Green's function then will correspond to this kernel and uh, you can get the new wave profile out of the old wave profile by doing this convolution operation. Uh, and so you have propagated forward in time, um, you have propagated forward in time um, the differential equation. Um, it's also very, very um, important in engineering, for example, um, in signal filtering. So the idea is um, you come in with some signal, that's the old function f, 
and for example, you want to have a smooth version of this function. Maybe f has some steps, but you want to have a new function that is very smooth. And so you would pick a kernel that looks like this, like a Gaussian, for example. Th as, long as soon as you do the convolution, you will end up with a function that is smooth. Or also you can pick a more interesting kernel that maybe has this shape where it goes between minus and plus. And you can work it out for yourself that then actually the new function is approximately the derivative of the old function. Yeah? Because whenever the old function was basically constant, then these negative and positive contributions, they just cancel and you get zero, as you would when you apply a derivative to a constant function. Whereas uh, whenever the old function f has a jump or otherwise changes, then even, when you even after you apply this kernel, you don't get precisely zero, but you get an approximate version of the derivative. Yeah? So there are many, many interesting um, um, applications. Good. So um, here I tell you that in principle you all, if you, do, if you do anything with computer graphics, you are all applying such kernels all the time. So if you have a program like GIMP that can um, work on uh, pixel pictures, on photographs, then you can apply so-called filters. And one of the simplest filters is that you want to make the picture more smooth. So uh, what happens there is exactly such a convolution, and you can uh, interpret it as meaning that you take any original pixel, and then it becomes a sort of spread out pixel. It's the same thing that would happen in some maybe optical transformation when you have a point source and, and you spread it out. Yeah. And so uh, this is now applied all across an image. And so the original image shown here will turn into a blurred version, into a smooth version uh, of this image. So I uh, simply apply a convolution operation with this kernel and I get the image on the right hand side. Here's another more interesting case. Maybe you don't want a blurred version of the image. Maybe rather you wanted to pick out the boundaries yeah, of areas. So um, you want to have it such that whenever an area is homogeneous in color, you just get zero. But whenever you have a boundary between two areas of different colors, uh, you get some finite result. And you can do this simply by picking another kernel. So uh, in this way of interpreting things, you can say, uh, an original pixel here is turned into um, positive values to its upper left corner, say, and negative values to its lower right corner. And again, this represents the kernel. And so this is um, picked in such a way that it will really get zero in, uh, when applied to a homogeneous area. Because in a homogeneous area, there's not only one pixel, there are, of course, many pixels of exactly the same color. Each of them will contribute to its vicinity, uh, this pattern of plus and minus but then uh, the pluses and the minuses all cancel exactly if, if, if I only have a homogeneous area, and so I get zero overall. But this is no longer true when I'm near the boundary between two areas, yeah? because then there are some pixels that do contribute this pattern, and then other pixels that are, say, already of zero value themselves, or have a, at least a different value, and then we, we don't get perfect cancellation, and then I don't get zero as a result. And so you see here in this picture, what happens. So this is the original picture, I apply this kind of kernel, and really I get either dark uh, black uh, or white uh, positive um, values at the boundaries, but I get zero, here depicted as gray, uh, everywhere else where basically I have homogeneous color or very, very uh, smooth changes. So this is something where you can highlight the boundaries. And obviously, that's very important in image processing. Um, here's an alternative view. So I told you right now a view, point of view where you say any original pixel contributes um, some new values in its vicinity. You can also say any pixel in the um, resulting image actually picks up values in its vicinity from the original image. So, so, so you can convert one uh, view into the other, and in both cases it's basically the kernel that you're talking about. But in one case you say each original pixel uh, spreads around in its uh, vicinity, and here you say each um, 
pixel in the target image and the new image picks up values from its vicinity. Uh, in either case, um, you get the same result. And so what happens when you tell your mm, program to apply these filters is really just this uh, convolution, which is just a linear weighted superposition of the original pixel values and weighted by the kernel by the kernel values, by the filter values. Yeah. So sometimes it's called kernel, sometimes it's called filter, it's the same thing. Okay. Now, sorry, now what we have in neural networks is in principle the same with the exception that now we will be training these filters. These filters will not be fixed by us, but we will be training them uh, just like in the same sense that we already updated the connections in the neural network even before, we will also be training these kernels. Okay. So now that will give rise to a new structure of the neural network and I have to explain this. What you see here is the standard um, neural network that we have been talking about, uh, some layer with neurons, uh, the next layer also with neurons, and then there are connections in principle between any two neurons and the two la layers. So you can have arbitrary connections. Of course, the weights will be adapted during training, but in principle, all of them can be non-zero. Now we want to move to a situation where we want to exploit this translational invariance. So for example, where these uh, neurons represent the color values of a one-dimensional image, let's say, and we want to see how to cope with that. And so here is the much simpler structure of a convolutional layer. So what happens if you want to apply this convolution or this filter concept or the kernel concept, it's all the same thing. Uh, you would say, oh, the value of the neuron in the new layer should probably only be determined by the values of the neurons in the vicinity in the lower layer. That was just, it's the same as I just explained for the images. Yeah? And so there's a certain region of influence that's called the size uh, of the kernel or of the filter. And then for each of these contributions that you get, you have a certain weight, W1, W2, W3 in this example. Of course, you could also have a kernel of larger size. And that's it. So these weights, they define the filter, they define the kernel. And the idea is now that you have the same structure for all the other neurons as well, for example, for this one, will also pick up contributions from all the three uh, neurons in the lower layer that lie in its vicinity. But the values of the weights for these three connections that I'm pointing out here, these values are not different, they are not new, they are not independent, they are exactly the same values as here. That's the translational invariance. Yeah? So we, we, we do not get to pick new values. It's exactly the same weights. And so that is, of course, an immense reduction in the memory that is required because I only need to store these three values of the weights instead of uh, many, many more. And so if I want to simplify the picture, I would leave away all the other connections. I only indicate the connections for one of these neurons in the upper layer, and I tell you that the rest works in the same way. Apart from that, I can still do the neural network in exactly the same way as before. So once I do this linear operation uh, involving the filter, I can still apply a nonlinear function here. Yeah? So that works uh, just as before. It's only the structure of the connections that has been simplified. Is this clear in principle? It seems it's clear. Okay, so. Um, basically, it's like playing around with your favorite um, JIMP filters, but instead of uh, choosing them in a menu, you let them be trained uh, in the usual neural network training way. Okay, so I already pointed out here we will learn the kernel weights, but essentially you're scanning the kernel over the original image. So, um, just to highlight how much you reduce the information that you need now. Um, if you have, if you'd had a layer with n neurons, and in our application here to the images, this would uh, correspond to the number of pixels in the image. Yeah? So if you have a 100 by 100 image, it's 10,000 pixels, so it's 10,000 neurons. So think of n as being 10,000. And so if you were to use the usual concept of fully connected uh, neurons, 
then you would have uh, one layer with 10,000 neurons and above that another layer with 10,000 neurons. And then you would have connections for every pair, so 10,000 times 10,000 connections. Yeah, so that's 10 to the 8 different connections. And so you would have to store 10 to the 8 different weights. That's a lot. Uh, it becomes very, very different with the convolutional network. So uh, the number of weights only scales with the size of the kernel. So if in these simple examples that I showed, the kernel was uh, 3 by 3, it had so 9, 9 pixels, then m is equal to 9. And so you compare <laughs> 10 to the 8 with 9. Of course, you also have much less power. You cannot do arbitrary things. For example, automatically, you cannot treat the upper left corner of the picture differently from the lower right corner. That's not allowed because everything is translationally invariant now. Uh, but still, it's, it's a great, great improvement. So the kernel size is independent of the size of the image, and uh, therefore we also have much, much lower memory consumption and uh, it's faster. Okay. And now I will go uh, through um, various modifications of this concept that uh, you can have. So um, instead of just saying, oh, I have my original source image and then one target image that I produce, and it's either the smooth version or it's the one where I take the derivative, uh, maybe for the purposes of my neural network, where I will have further layers uh, above this, Maybe it's a smart idea to do to try out several of these operations. Yeah, uh, that's similar to what we did before in the old kinds of networks. Uh, we did not go from all the input neurons to a single output neuron, and then we can only calculate one function. But we went to several output neurons, each of which can calculate effectively a different function of the input neurons, uh, and that helps us to do something smarter. And so here, what people talk about in this context for convolutional networks is that you could have several channels. So out of one original source image, you produce several images, and for each of those, you might apply a different filter. So the red one might be the one where you do the smoothing operation, the other one might be the one where you take the derivative, and so on. But of course, again, you do not uh, hardwire these operations, but this will be something that the network trains on. This doesn't cost much more. It's just that for every new channel, you have to store another set of weights for this kernel, so it's not very, um, that much. Okay, but it's very, very useful. And so how do, you, how do you implement this? And so again, it's very beautiful that you don't need to do this yourself. You don't need to program this yourself. Uh, so in Keras, um, you automatically have access to these convolutional layers. And so let me just go through this yeah, this one line, <laughs> essentially, that gives you a convolutional layer. So um, we already learned that if net is my neural network, then with net.add, I can add yet another layer to the neural network. And now this layer, however, is of a different type than before. It's not dense, it's not fully connected, but it's called conf for convolutional. And in this case, maybe because I'm trying to process an image, I pick conf2d, so I really have a 2D image. Uh, I could have a 1D image also, or a 3D thing, but here it's a conf2d for an image. Um, if this is the first layer that I have after the input layer, then I, as usual, I have to specify the input shape. Yeah? And in my case, if I have an n by n image, I would write n comma n for an n by n image. And then I still have to specify a third number because we were talking about these channels. And maybe my input image is already red, green, blue. It's a color image. Then I would have three channels. If it's a grayscale image, I only have a single channel. And so that is specified here. Okay. So that's the input shape. And then I want to tell how many, how many filters do I have, by which I mean how many of these channels will I generate? Will it only be one new image or will it be several? And so that happens here. I just pick 20 because I felt like picking 20. <laughs> and so uh, I will generate 20 new channels, 20 images. So out of one input image, I make 20 images because I think maybe this helps my neural network to discover some interesting processing. And then I still have to specify how large is my filter or my kernel. 
So I, I say 11 by 11. So the zone of influence around a given pixel will be 11 pixels by 11 pixels. Now so it's already more powerful than the 3 by 3 that I talked about in the beginning. So you can do more with that. And uh, then there's the activation function, so the nonlinear function. Maybe I pick relu, rectified linear unit, that's fine. And then there are some extra options that you have if you have a convolutional uh, filter. Um, some of them have to do with what happens at the boundaries of the image, at the borders, at the edges. Because, um, you know, each pixel has to reach out to its uh, neighborhood and pick up the values from its neighborhood. But then what do you do with a pixel that sits at the edge of the image, yeah? Because it, its neighborhood is cut into two, yeah? So what do you assume? And one thing you can assume is that uh, all the pixels that are outside of the actual image, th they will be counted as if they have zero value. Yeah. You could also just uh, refrain from using the pixels up to the very edge of the image and only uh, use the pixels inside the image so much that even their whole neighborhood uh, def defined by the kernel size is still within the image, but then you would uh, if in effect end up with a target image that is smaller than the original image, and maybe you don't want that. So there are various versions of this. Okay, but this essentially gives you a um, convolutional layer, and then you would stack several of these convolutional layers one above the other, and using exactly the same function, so it's really, really easy. There are other tricks you can play, and all of them are implemented in Keras. So sometimes you have the feeling, okay, um, maybe it would be good if I reduce the resolution of my image, because uh, then the number of neurons gets smaller. And this will actually be an important part of these image recognition neural networks. Yeah? So at some point you want to decrease the resolution. So what's the options that you take uh, that, that are available? Well, again, it's connected to what you can do in, a, in, in your graphics program. Yeah? You can also downscale the image, and then probably what it does is it tries to take the average o over the pixel values in some region and define that as the new pixel value. So that's how you downscale and still get a nice looking image. And so um, this is also what's available for convolutional neural networks. Uh, that uh, case uh, would be called average pooling. So you take many pixels, you calculate the average pixel value, and then you replace all these many pixels by a single pixel, which automatically means, of course, the picture will get smaller. So, so he here's the pixels that become the new pixel, and actually that gives rise to an uh, image that has been shrunk. Um, maybe you are not satisfied with getting the average value. Maybe you want to get the maximum value. Why would you want to get the maximum value? Well, maybe the values indicate something more abstract. Maybe they indicate, well, I've been looking at a picture of, uh, I don't know, apples in a tree, and I have detected, oh, there is one apple. Uh, and so if the presence of an apple indicates is indicated by a one, and otherwise it's zero, maybe even after this downsampling, you want to keep the information that in this particular area there had been one apple, and then you would pick this max pooling operation, as it's called. Okay, so there are several different versions, and it's really easy to implement. So again, it's just one line. You say, oh, now I think I need this uh, average pooling operation, and you just tell it uh, what's the size of the zone of influence over which I average, and that's it. For some very particular applications, you even might want to enlarge the image. Yeah? So you take uh, one pixel and turn it into many. And again, this is possible. Uh, you can say something like upsampling 2D in Keras, and you have to give it the size. So uh, you have to tell it, okay, an original pixel, single pixel, would turn into an 8x8 eight eight grid. And what this would then do, it would simply repeat the value. So if the pixel w uh, was value 0.7, it just puts the value 0 0.7 in this grid of 8 by 8. Yeah. So there are these various options that you can play. And so now uh, when people design such a neural network uh, that becomes more and more complex, they like to show pictures such as the one shown here. Yeah. So um, you see the different layers represented and the operations uh, that happen in between them. And so um, for example, here you have your input image, represented as the square. 
and then you want to say, oh, I'm applying a convolutional operation. Maybe you indicate it here like this, convolutional. Maybe you also uh, uh, indicate it in the way shown here. You say, I always pick up contributions from such a large area uh, and they uh, give me the value of the pixel in the new image. So that's the convolution operation. That's the filter that we talked about. And maybe you have not only one of these filters, but several filters. So you uh, produce several channels. And so that's indicated here by stacking these different uh, images. Okay. And then maybe the next operation was this uh, downsampling or subsampling, where you reduce the size and the resolution of the image. So that happens here. So you draw a smaller image. Then maybe you have another convolution operation. And you don't need to keep the number of channels the same. Even in the first step, remember, you change the number of channels. So you can go arbitrarily between different numbers of channels. Then maybe you do another subsampling. Uh, and then at some point, often, there comes the point where you say, OK, now I reduced my resolution so much, it doesn't make much sense anymore to talk about this translational invariance and so on. Uh, at some point, I also want to produce my output neurons. The output neurons no longer have the meaning of an image. The output neurons, remember, for the image classification, it might be just 10 neurons th that have a one-hot encoding that tell you which digit you re just recognized. So um, at least at some point, you have to go, you have to switch from the convolutional layers down to the usual standard uh, fully connected layers. And so that can be done mm, because these images, remember, they now have a very small resolution, so they don't have many pixels, many neurons anymore anyway. So even if I pick all of them together in all of the channels, all of the pixels together, I don't know what I get, maybe 1,000 or so, 500, uh, and then I can tell uh, Keras or whatever I'm using, I can tell that now please uh, convert these, um, con these images, convert them, just treat them as if you would treat uh, an arbitrary layer of neurons and connect them in an arbitrary dense fashion with all-to-all -all connections to a standard layer of neurons. And from that point on, you would proceed in the standard manner. So from that point on, it's really all-to-all -all connections. But the number of neurons at this step is already very reduced. And so that's fine. Yeah? So I don't have too many weights here. OK, so this is the kind of thing that people um, talk about when they do image recognition. So there was one thing in this uh, picture, in this layout, uh, that I didn't specify precisely yet. So I told you that um, I could have three channels here, six channels he there, so I can really change the number of channels. Uh, but what do I actually calculate in, in detail when I do this? Um, so one pixel here in this blue channel, the, the channel that is represented by this blue image, uh, where does it get its contributions from if I have three channels in the preceding layer? Yeah? And the answer is it gets contributions from all these channels. And there will be a different kernel, a different filter for each of these channels. So this pixel will get contributions from the blue image, from the green, and from the red image. Yeah? And so I would store three different filters, three different kernels, or three different sets of weights in order just to get this one um, a blue image. Yeah? And then there would be different such way sets of weights for the new green channel and the new red channel and so on. So um, overall, there will be a kernel or a filter for each combination of the channels. So if I have three ingoing channels, six outgoing channels, there will be three times six filters. And each filter, again, is um, a small uh, matrix of size k times k, if k is the filter size, as, in as indicated up here. And so now we start to store again more weights, but still it's much, much less than you would have if you had fully connected. Yeah? And so you, you see this gives you a lot of power. Yeah? So you can take the red, green, blue values of the red, green, blue input channels of an image, combine them in arbitrary ways, and they contribute to a new channel. And then you can combine them in different arbitrary ways and give you another uh, new output channel, and so on and so on. So you can um, play around with this. In some abstract way, um, you could even say that if I want to compare against my fully connected situation, 
you remember if I had 100 neurons in the lower layer, 50 neurons in the upper layer, I have to store 100 times 50 weights because there are 100 times 50 connections in this case. Now the role in this new situation, the role of the neurons in the old fully connected case are in some sense played by the channels. So if I have three channels in the lower layer and six channels in the upper layer, then I have to store three times eight weights or more precisely kernels, that is weight matrices. Yeah. So there's interesting connections there. Okay, but again, this is very simple to uh, implement in Keras. You, you wouldn't, I am only telling these things to you so you understand what's going on behind the scenes, uh, but you would just um, use uh, commands like this to stack one layer above the other and in one of the layers you would say filters equals three and in the next one you would say filters equals six and you would specify the kernel sizes and it would automatically allocate the uh, weights that you need and it would start to train them and so on. Because that's now the nice thing. You construct this network you stack the convolutional layers, you do the subsampling and all this, all this stuff. But once you've constructed the network, you will train it exactly as before. Yeah? So the input and the output, you treat just as we had before. Yeah? You mm, produce your training samples, maybe the output you think should be one hot encoded. You do exactly what we discussed before, only the structure of the network in between will be different. Okay, and so you can apply this to examples and the obvious first example is uh, to try this with uh, handwritten digits that we already um, looked at with our fully connected network, but now we can apply this uh, convolutional network. And so the input images are rather modest in size, 28 by 28, that's not much by today's standards, but this was invented in the 90s, okay. Um, and then you do convolution, maybe you have several channels, here I picked seven channels, then maybe you want to downsample the resolution, maybe instead of the 28, you want to divide this by a factor of four, so you really downsample a lot. Um, so you have now s still seven channels, but maybe b seven by seven pixel images. And then finally, you want to switch to the fully connected layers, and here I did it even in in one single step, I could also then have a few further fully connected layers, but okay, that's up to me. And I can still have arbitrary nonlinear functions, so here maybe picking ReLU, but in the end for the output, I would pick softmax because that gives me the probability distribution. Okay, is there a question about the structure of these neural networks? So these are the pictures you find in many scientific papers on image recognition and similar tasks. Okay. So then let's um, see. This is how I would implement the neural network that I've just shown to you in this picture. Um, I would still say my network is of the sequential type, which just means there's one layer after the other, one layer uh, layered on top of the other. Uh, then I would say, well, I want a, a convolutional layer for a 2D image. I specify the shape of my input image. I say I might have one seven channels, so that corresponds to seven filters, kernel size five times five, and so on and so on. Then I want to downsample. Here I told you I want to downsample by a factor of four. And now there's the operation um, that I talked about before, where I want to switch from the convolutional layer to the fully connected layer, and this operation is called flatten. So flatten also in um, NumPy, when you do linear algebra, it basically means you go from a matrix uh, to a simple vector. Yeah? You, instead of having a structure that looks like an image, you just put all the neurons one after the other and so it becomes just one long list of numbers and from the point of view of the network they are not distinguished anymore in any particular way. It's just one long list of numbers. And then uh, I have already my output layer so with 10 uh, neurons and the softmax activation. Well and that's it. The rest really works um, as before. And so here's uh, results. 
um, on this handwritten digit uh, example with a convolutional neural network, um, it really reaches a very nice um, accuracy. So the uh, error on the test data is here already below 2%. So it really paid off and the number of weights is much reduced. Now one of the things you can try again is try to interpret what the neural network does. Remember we tried this when we uh, reproduced our smiley image using a neural network and now uh, you also want to look at what the neural network is doing. And so for these uh, convolutional neural networks you can try to look directly at the weights. The weights are basically the components of the filter of the kernel and if you have several channels of course you have several kernels. And so um, remember for the kernel size, I picked five by five. So that's why each of these little images that represents a kernel is five by five pixels. And so these are now the seven kernels that it came up with that for the network turned out to be useful in recognizing uh, digits. And it's not that it's so easy to interpret, but you can see already some structure. There might be a line diagonal like this or maybe um, in the other direction. So you can sort of see fragments of images. And so what will happen if you scan such a fragment of an image, uh, that is the uh, filter, if you scan it uh, across the input image, then what happens is basically the resulting pixel values will always be high if the input image feature at this spot matches uh, the filter and uh, if it doesn't match at all, if it just looks like noise or zero or so, then the uh, resulting pixel value will not be high. So it's uh, really uh, a little bit looking for features uh, in the input image, looking for these kinds of features. But then of course uh, this is not yet the end result after that there are still these densely connected layers. Um, so s there are still several steps in the neural network until you finally get the prediction of uh, which digit you're looking at. Okay. And so here's a little aside because it turns out that similar things are also happening in your brain. <laughs> so um, when you look at, uh, at some picture, uh, then the first, it is known that the first layers of image processing also have functions that are very simple and that may amount just to uh, 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 understanding where the boundaries are, yeah, to see contrast. And uh, not only to see contrast, but also to determine when you have determined there is a boundary, uh, what, is the, what is the orientation of the boundary? Yeah? Is, it, is it horizontal or vertical or anything other? And so uh, the filters that would tell you this, the filters that are good for detecting both the contrast at the boundary and even the orientation of a boundary, they are called uh, Gabor filters. Uh, so Mr. Gabor was the same who invented holography. And so uh, such a Gabor filter is really a very simple object. It's basically a Gaussian function, a 2D Gaussian function in the XY plane, multiplied by some sine function. So that's why one part, say, is positive and the other part is negative. And now you no, we already discussed this. If you have a kernel that has positive and negative parts, it's taking something like a derivative. And if you scan it across a homogeneous area, it will give zero. But if you scan it uh, in the vicinity of a boundary, it will give something non-zero. And more precisely, the orientation uh, of this is also important, yeah? Because um, only if your boundary is also oriented in the same manner, then you actually get a signal. If your boundary is perpendicular to this, then again cancellation applies and you don't see anything. So the, the resulting pixel values of the target image uh, will be non-zero only at places where you have detected a boundary that has this particular orientation. And so these filters are in general useful obviously for feature extraction in images. You, you learn where are the boundaries and they are usually important and you learn even how they are oriented. And uh, these filters are even believed to be a good, uh, approxi f a good approximation for the first stages of what goes on uh, when you look at an image. Okay. Now we can now we can play around. We can basically um, 
take our convolutional network setup and say, oh, maybe we can make more progress uh, by making it more complicated. So how can you make it more complicated? Well, you could take more channels, uh, you could um, not uh, reduce the resolution too much in a first step, um, and then have further network layers. So you increase the number of layers, you increase the number of neurons, and so on. So you would think that this neural network should become more powerful. Let's see what happens. Well, when I ran this, it turns out disappointment. So it doesn't really learn at all. It gets 90% wrong. Um, and the error, yeah, so the error is 90%. That's really bad. So what happens? Why does it not learn? And it gets just some very noisy kernels. Okay. And it turns out this is a matter of how you set up the training. And it turns out this is one of the examples where training with the usual stochastic gradient descent that we discussed so far is really a little bit too simple. Maybe you can get it to work at some point if you pick the right learning rate or uh, train for long enough, but at least not easily. And so then there are more sophisticated um, learning methods that are able to adaptively choose the learning rate in a smart way. We will discuss them later in detail how they work, but I already advertise here the, uh, the standard um, procedure nowadays for most purposes. It's called ADAM, so it's about adaptive. Um, and this works very nicely on this example. So here you see again how the accuracy goes up and you get an error of 1.7%. Okay. And there's obviously lots of room to try to improve the performance and play around with the parameters. Okay. And so, um, again, for the homework or during the tutorials, you can try to play around with the code that I put uh, into, the, into the repository on the website and uh, just try, try a little bit longer training, which I wasn't uh, patient enough to do, <laughs> and then maybe have a look at the filters try to see whether you can spot something that is reminiscent of these Gabor filters. Okay. So are there any uh, questions at this spot? Yes, please. Ah, uh, okay. So can we get automatic arbitrary sizes? I'm not aware, uh, at least not in the standard uh, implementations of having this. Uh, the problem is a little bit, uh, the kernel size is obviously, um, well, first it's an integer parameter, so it's not something that we can easily put into the gradient descent and have as a continuous parameter. So uh, probably you'd end up trying out different versions of the network and training again. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, another question. Uh, okay, good question, yeah. So, yes, in principle, for the very lowest layers, you might want to start already with filters that you think are good. So th there's nothing that speaks against this. Uh, for the higher layers, it would probably not be practical because you don't know what is the best solution. And uh, then it starts to depend more and more on the application. But it's true for the lowest layers, it's, on, it's practically always good to find the boundaries. So yes, you, you could uh, start by initializing such filters. Yes. Actually, there's a s related technique where you train a neural network on a large set of images, and you are sure that just by having looked at all these images, independent of the task that it has to fulfill, the lowest layers will have learned some, some good filters. And then you can also use reuse the same network basically for other tasks because you're pretty sure that the, at least the lowest layers, they are going in the right direction. Okay. So um, I now want to switch to something that um, is a little bit different than what we've done so far. So far, we've done a completely supervised learning. So in the sense, we have a lot of training samples. We always know what's the input and how we want to label the input. Yeah, so, so we provide this. 
Um, but then again, there are many applications in science and technology where maybe you just have a large data set, but you actually don't have any labels. You just have a large set of images, but you don't have any labels, for example. Or a, l a large set of curves, experimental data, you don't have any labels. Still, you want to do something with this. Yeah? You want to extract the crucial features of this large training set. And so um, that, in general, is the domain of unsupervised learning. Unsupervised because you don't provide the right answers, in a way. And so here I want to discuss one of the simplest such cases. Uh, it's unsupervised in the sense you don't have any labels. You only have, say, a set of images. And this example is yeah, conceptually and philosophically very interesting, and it also played an important role in the development of deep neural networks. And the example is called an autoencoder. Yeah, autoencoder. So what is this about? The input will be an image, and the output also will be an image of exactly the same size. And the task we give our neural network is simply to reproduce the image. So the output we demand to be exactly identical to the input. I if that is true, our cost function will be minimal. Now you say, okay, that's not really a challenge. <laughs> I can just copy the input to the output, so where's the challenge? But we make it a challenge because, um, first of all, we use a convolutional neural network structure, uh, but that's only part of it. That's uh, natural if we have an image. And then we use downsampling and upsampling again. So we first reduce the resolution until we have very small images in what you might call a bottleneck. And then we upsample again. We increase uh, the resolution again in the final part. And that makes it difficult, you see, because if you had 10,000 pixels here, but in your bottleneck you only have, I don't know, 100, then obviously in order to be able to reproduce the input image, you have to have some sort of compression going on. So the network has to train, during training it has to find a smart way of encoding all the information that is in the input image, encoding it in much less pixel values, and then also be able to extract it again in the second part that is uh, called a decoder in order to reproduce uh, the image. Yeah. And of course we ask this not for one particular image, that would be easy, but to do it on an arbitrary image out of a large pool of images. So how can this even work? It certainly cannot work if your input images are completely arbitrary, are completely random. If you, throw, uh, uh, if you uh, draw random numbers uh, to produce a completely noisy input image and then you demand that the output image exactly reproduces this, uh, this will never work because then there is so much in potential information in the input image, all the 10,000 pixels are completely independent random numbers that you cannot possibly compress it down to 100 pixels. But of course, the usual images we are dealing with are not white noise images. They are not completely random. Uh, rather, they have um, very interesting large-scale structures. So there are large areas that carry the same color. Um, then there are some boundaries and so on. So um, they have, in a sense, much less information than you would guess from them having 10,000 pixels. Yeah? So there's a lot of correlations, let's say, between the pixel values. And so that makes it possible to compress them. Also, otherwise, none of the compression techniques that, we, that you have on your computer, like JPEG and so on, they could never possibly work if you insisted on being able to compress a completely arbitrary random uh, image. Okay. And so what we have here then really is a form of data compression adapted to the typical inputs. That's important. If you show lots and lots of pictures of cats, then this uh, autoencoder will become very good at recognizing the typical features of cats and encoding them in its bottleneck and reproducing pictures of cats. But it will fail miserably with pictures of cars. So it, it's really training to become good at compressing the typical input. Yeah? And so that means it has learned something about the structure of the typical input. It has learned some concepts about the input. And that makes it uh, interesting even from a conceptual point of view. 
Um, so you still need a lot of training examples. Either you have access to a large database of images, okay, or you can generate those examples algorithmically if you just want to try it out. For example, you could um, take circles and you randomly place them in the input image and these are all the input images that you'd ever generate so it's always just one circle placed at some random spot and then what will happen is that the network learns to detect the position of the circle and that will be somehow encoded in the bottleneck and then that's enough information to reproduce the image because you just it just has to learn how to produce an image that shows a circle at the right uh, location And so, um, yeah, you can try this out. This is just the same graphical representation that I showed before. You start from an input image, maybe you have several channels, you downsample, downsample, and then you upsample, upsample again, um, and you pick something that hopefully works, and then you apply it to this uh, case. So I really generate many, many input images of circles placed at random positions. I enforce a cost function, just quadratic deviation that uh, measures the deviation between input and output images. And then I see what training gives me and indeed the uh, cost function decreases uh, during training as you can see here. And at least uh, at the end of this training procedure, the output, if I give this input image, the output looks like this. Maybe it's not yet great, okay, <laughs> so it's a little bit blurred. Uh, because I'm doing this upsampling, uh, first downsampling and then upsampling and so on. But at least it starts to put a circle at the right location. Yeah? So it has learned that for my set of training images, it was always about a circle. And now you can use this game and make it even more challenging. For example, instead of just asking that the output exactly matches the input, you could demand that the output is even better than the input. So how would you do this? Well, imagine you are producing a lot of clean images of a circle randomly placed, and then you make each of them noisy by just adding some noise, and that will be the input image that you feed into your autoencoder, but the output image that you compare against where you calculate the quadratic deviation, you take the clean image. So you force the autoencoder to invent a way to turn your original noisy image into a nice clean image. Again, this only works because all your images have a certain structure, because otherwise you could never distinguish. Yeah? If your images would be arbitrary noise, and then you say, oh, I add noise, but please give me the original noisy image, of course this can never work, because how do you know no which noise is which? So this can only work because there's some structure to the images, uh, that you can then get rid of in this way. And the uh, autoencoder really learns uh, how to do this correctly. And so there's obvious applications. Yeah? So uh, you, uh, if you have images, so, so you would first train it on simulated noise. So you have nice images that where you add some noise and then you train it in this way. And then in real world applications, of course, you don't know what is the correct clean image, but if it's well trained, you can apply it to a noisy image and maybe uh, extract a clean image. Okay, and then there are many, many things you can play around with when you have autoencoders, yeah? So um, you could start with a very simple autoencoder network. So input layer, one hidden layer, output layer. Okay, fine. So maybe you train it, it gives you results that are okay-ish, but not great. And then you could do this. You could um, take it apart and introduce new layers in the middle and even more layers, even smaller layers, so, uh, and, and then continue training all the time. And that is actually a way to train quite efficiently. So here I show it uh, more precisely. Um, whenever two layers are connected, they are connected by weights. In the convolutional case, this would be the entries of the filter, but for the fully connected case, these are arbitrary. Um, you would train them. Um, and then you would fix these weights. So here they are fixed, there they are fixed. You, you take those weights that you, you got in the first training, uh, part of the training here. And in the next part of the training, you only keep free the inner connections that connect the inner layers. And 
So what happens is basically you get a rough structure first, you train it, you fix it, and then you introduce new layers, you can train them and fix them and so on and so on, and you can drag out this uh, stack of layers that make your autoencoder more and more. And so um, this has actually historically proven quite useful when people first started to train these very deep uh, neural networks with many layers to do tricks like this. Yeah? So you first train a simple thing and then you add more complications. Also, once you got something that works reasonably well, you could then say, oh, now let me uh, make all the weights trainable. Let me say all the weights can change and let me still train a little bit because then I can fine tune further. So to speak, I already have a solution that is pretty good, but I want to fine tune a little bit. That, that will work nicely. Okay. And then there are other applications. So, um, for example, you can take this autoencoder, train it on images that are not labeled, train it for a long time until it becomes really good. And then you can chop it in two parts and uh, make use of it. So the way this works would be the following. So you have trained your autoencoder, where the output is supposed to be equal to the input. Then after training, you just keep the lower half, the encoder part, you keep. And then you add, say, one or several uh, layers on top of the last, of the bottleneck part, on top of the last image of this encoder part. And these layers then, they are being trained on a supervised uh, task. So there, for example, you ask that labels uh, should be generated in the correct way. And you can do this. Um, and the funny thing is, you would only have these uh, weights in the red part uh, being trained. All the other weights are already fixed, but all the other weights are already doing something useful because they have been trained to extract the most crucial features from the image. And now you're inputting these crucial features into your actual classifier, that's the red part. And if these were indeed crucial features, then probably the classifier should do well uh, based on these features. Yeah? So that's a nice way to, to use an autoencoder to, to actually then, uh, on top of that, uh, do supervised uh, learning. And so uh, some people call this um, first training the autoencoder pre-training. So you pre-train on images without specifying even the task that you have in mind later, and then uh, you do the supervised training. Is that part clear? So that's a, a smart strategy. Okay. There are also modifications, again, um, of a different sort. Um, so there's this bottleneck, but maybe we don't know how large we should choose it. If it's too small, it will not work. This is clear, and it will fail. Uh, but we pick a certain size of this bottleneck. And um, one thing people have invented is, so, so picking a s if we pick a certain size, the neural network might make use of all of them nominally, but maybe it's wasting resources in a way. And also maybe this is hard to interpret. So what people came up with uh, as a solution is to add something to the cost function that now depends on these values of the neurons in this bottleneck layer. And the cost function will be higher if many of these neurons have non-zero values, and it will be lower if many of the neurons have actually zero values. So there is a reward if um, the network finds a way of encoding the information in very few neurons in the bottleneck. Yeah? And so that, that's very nice because first of all, maybe then later on you can throw away the rest of the neurons and have a smaller neural network. And also it's very good to be able to interpret things yeah? because now you have a nice compact, maybe the minimum representation uh, in the bottleneck neurons. And so it's much easier to interpret what's going on. Okay. And so then finally, what are autoencoders actually good for? Um, so th there were times when they were used very heavily and then maybe times when they were used less. But um, so in historically they were useful for pre-training, but nowadays really one can essentially set up a full uh, deep neural network with many layers and just train it from scratch and mm, uh, often it works. Um, they are interesting conceptually because they are an interesting example of 
unsupervised, or you could say self-supervised, the input should be equal to the output, yeah, but you don't have any labels. So uh, an interesting example of this type of unsupervised learning. Um, but on the other hand, asking it for this detailed reconstruction of the input, which we are doing, so the output should be equal to the input, maybe is not the smartest way to force it to extract the most crucial features. Uh, you have to realize at some point, um, uh, if it wants to become really, really good, then it has to uh, somehow memorize even the smallest uh, features of the input image uh, where you placed it, how, what was the line width of the lines in your image and so on. So uh, maybe this is a little bit too much and uh, is not really the most uh, crucial features really. Still, it has been successful to give uh, a compressed representations and even to visualize the features of data by just looking at uh, the activations of these bottleneck neurons. Uh, in principle, you could apply autoencoders even to data compression because they have learned for a given set of training images how to best, in some way, <laughs> compress the data. Um, but at least nowadays, it's not really competitive with the generic algorithms that are running on your computer. Okay. So um, maybe I still start uh, this section, um, unless there's still a question about the autoencoders. Nice concept. Also, you will find code in the in the repository. Okay, if not, um, let us ask a little bit funny question. So uh, up to now, I always told you we need these nonlinear functions, right? So otherwise the neural network doesn't do a very complicated operation if we don't have any nonlinear functions. But for a moment, let's just imagine a purely linear neural network. So the f of z is equal to z. It's there is no nonlinear function involved. And so more specifically, imagine a purely linear autoencoder. And the question is, which weights will it select? What will it do? So um, here I depicted it. I have input, output, one hidden layer in between, but there is no nonlinearity. All these, uh, so the f is absent. Everything is linear. So the only thing that happens is this linear superposition um, thing. Now, th this is still non-trivial. It's non-trivial again because the size of the bottleneck here is not equal to the size of the input image. Uh. So it still has to do some compression. And the question is, what is the best compression that such a linear autoencoder can choose? Yeah. That's an interesting question. And to, to answer or to better understand this challenge or this question, um, let's imagine what's going on. So we know in order to calculate the value of one neuron in this inner layer, we actually take a linearly weighted superposition of all the input neurons. And if I'm thinking of densely connected layers, which I will here do for a moment, uh, then for another bottleneck neuron, I can have a different combination of weights uh, uh, for, for weighting the input neurons. Okay. So um, if I think of all the input neurons as one long vector of values, then to have a weighted superposition of them to give me one value of an output neuron uh, is just like taking the scalar product with a vector. No? A weighted superposition of the entries of a vector is I can obtain by taking the scalar product with another vector, namely the vector of weights. Okay. So what we're looking at here is scalar product operations. Yeah? So each uh, of these uh, bottleneck neurons is really equal to the scalar product of some suitably chosen weight vector with all the input neurons. Okay, so this is already interesting. So we're going in the direction of linear algebra. And so in some sense now, uh, we want to know which are the optimal weights, which means which are the optical ve optimal vectors to pick to take the scalar products of your input neurons with. But taking a scalar product with a vector, at least if the vector is normalized, um, 
that's like a projection on this vector, right? So we are asking, you give me input vectors, these are the images in, in our case, many different input vectors, and I have a choice of projecting them on a few suitably chosen basis vectors. Which ones should I pick in order to extract the maximum information? This is essentially what this linear autoencoder will answer. Um, so let's go into some more detail here. Um, so this is the input layer. I, I label its neurons by K. This is the hidden layer. I label its neurons by J. And so now, uh, just as usual, um, we have the weights that connect J to K, W, J, K. Um, but uh, I can now say, oh, let me, let me interpret that as the components of a vector V. Yeah? So, um, so to speak, the projection of K, of this particular input neuron, so K is a basis vector that has a one only here, um, onto Vj, that would be Wjk. And so, so what happens is what I just explained. So the uh, neuron values of this hidden layer will be the amplitudes of the input vector, all of them, in the basis of this uh, V vectors, uh, Vj. So for each J, I have a different vector. I, I label them Vj. And uh, these are the weight vectors that I was talking about. And we are projecting onto these weight vectors. And so similarly, um, for the output, for the connection to the output, so going from hidden to output, I do the same, and I even keep it symmetrically. So here I keep the same, uh, the same vectors. Okay. And so now, um, assuming for a moment that I have normalized them, um, I will now take something that um, you know as a projector. Yeah. So here I just take the. Um, so this is now quantum mechanics notation. So. <laughs> I take the uh, cat and bra for a vector vj. And so for any given vector, I can uh, apply this to this vector, which will result in the scalar product between vj and this particular input vector being taken. And the result of this scalar product, the result of this projection, will give me a weight with which um, the vector vj occurs in the output. Okay. And so now my claim is to go from the input to the output, if you follow this line of reasoning, the network really only does this. It, it takes the input vector, it projects it onto Vj, and then it reproduces Vj. So it applies this projector P, or this operation P, onto the input vector Psi. And the reason why this does not necessarily precisely uh, reproduce the input vector is that the number of basis vectors that I'm choosing here is smaller than the total dimension of my Hilbert space. If I have a full basis, then of course this, um, this projector will just be the identity and then I will just reproduce my input vector and then there's really nothing that happens, but then there's also no compression. Yeah? So the funny thing is that the number of vectors Vj is smaller uh, than the full, uh, full uh, dimension of the Hilbert space. And so what we are now asking is really to reproduce a given vector, namely our input vector, as well as possible by decomposing it into a set of vectors that do not form a full complete basis. So we only can say the dimension was 10, but we only can pick three. Which three should we pick is the question. And of course, uh, qualitatively speaking, it's sort of clear if the vectors typically are lying in the xy plane and very rarely point along the z direction, and uh, I give you only two vectors to choose instead of three, then you should pick the x and y basis vectors instead of the z direction because then you lose the least amount of information. Yeah. So this is somehow the, the challenge that happens here. And so for simplicity, I will, in my argument, assume the input vector to be normalized. Um, but what we are really uh, doing then in the end uh, is more general. Okay. And so what we really want is something of th this sort. So the uh, action of the neural network, which I claimed was the action of P onto the input vector, should reproduce as well as possible uh, the input vector. So Psi should be approximately equal to P times Psi. 
And this should not only work for one particular input vector, then it would be easy actually, but for all the typical input vectors. Yeah. So here I, I'm assuming actually that the average has already been subtracted. Um, that makes my argument here a little bit easier. And so when I say it should be true, it should be a good approximation for all the typical input vectors, what do I really mean? What I really mean is I have a cost function that measures the quadratic deviation between what the network produces and what is the desired uh, output vector, and I want to minimize this. I want to minimize it when averaging over all the input vectors, so that I try to write down here. So P times Psi is what the network produces. Psi is the desired output equal to the input vector. I take the difference, I take the norm squared, uh, because that's the quadratic deviation, and I average over all input vectors. Yeah. And if you work this out, so taking the norm squared of this is basically taking this vector and taking the scalar product with itself. Uh, uh, in one line, basically, you arrive at this formula. So our task now is to minimize this formula by choosing P suitable by choosing the vectors vj in a suitable manner. And so now, uh, this is really nicely connected to physics. So if you have heard quantum mechanics, and especially about a density matrix, you will feel that this will be very, very familiar. If you haven't, then you have to uh, <laughs> listen more carefully, okay? So somehow, um, Somehow we have to incorporate the fact that we are averaging over this big space of typical input vectors. Yeah? And the question is, how should we do this? Yeah? I mean, of course, whenever you give me a, well, numerically, surely I could uh, calculate this, but this is now our, not our point here. We want a general answer that will work, uh, whatever. And so somehow I have to characterize the statistical properties of the input vectors psi in such a way that it is useful for me. What is useful for me? Well, you know, this expression is somehow quadratic in the components of psi. So if I can characterize what's the average of, the, of any quadratic function of the components of psi, that will be a very good thing because it will help me to solve this particular problem. Yeah? Okay. So now, um, people in physics have invented a matrix that in physics would be called a density matrix. Um, let me first uh, write it down in terms of components. So if Psi is one of the many input vectors, and later I will average over Psi, and Psi M is its component number M. Now, of course, I could just average over Psi M itself, but maybe this is already zero. I assume that the average is zero, so, so that's not really the interesting part. But um, in the formula that I'm about to optimize, as I just said, psi appears quadratically. So it would be good if I learned something about what is the average of psi m with another component, let's call it psi n. And now I even chose to choose to write it in the same way that you would write it in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, psi would be complex. For our images, usually it's not complex, but still I choose the notation of quantum mechanics. Uh, so then it's the best uh, thing to to accompany uh, Psi with Psi star. So you have Psi M times Psi N star. So you multiply two components of the given vector Psi. And now you average over all possible Psi. You pick out of your large, large training set. This is where all the, where the specific features of your particular challenge will um, come into play, the particular set of images that you care about, yeah? because they determine what will be the result of this correlator. Essentially, it's a statistical correlator. You multiply two random variables, uh, you take the average. Yeah? So if these two random variables, for example, have nothing to do with each other, if they are independently fluctuating, then this average will be zero. Yeah? I assume their averages alone are zero, so then this uh, correlator will be zero. And that would be the case if your input images are just white noise with ran completely random pixel values, then this would be zero. Um, except for m equals n, of course, with where it cannot be zero because it's just the average of a positive number. Okay. So um, now here I explained it for particular values of m and n, 
but I'm interested in potentially all the different combinations M and N. And so I can range through these combinations. I have now two indices, and that defines a matrix. So this is the density matrix. Rho M N is the average over all Psi of Psi M times Psi N star. And if you're used to uh, quantum mechanics notation, there's a more elegant way of writing it. You take the, uh, essentially something like the projector on Psi. So if Psi is normalized, this is the projector, Psi, Psi, and you average this over all Psi. Or if you, if you tell me I have only a certain discrete set of vectors that occur with certain probabilities, Pj, uh, then this is another way of writing explicitly the average. So you take Psi j, Psi j, weight it by Pj, and you sum over all j. Yeah? So these are just many different ways to express one and the same object, which is called the density matrix. And this is a great object to have because it characterizes fully the statistical properties of this whole ensemble of, I don't know, 100,000 training images that you might have. It characterizes their statistical properties fully uh, in terms of, well, quadratic uh, combinations of, uh, of the pixel values in our case. And it is exactly these quadratic combinations that we use here. Okay. And so next time, I will then tr uh, explain to you how we actually make use of this. How we can, in a second step, say, okay, now what is the perfect choice for uh, my vectors, for my incomplete basis? What is the perfect choice to uh, reproduce the input vectors? And you will see that this will be related to the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this particular matrix. Yeah. So that's a very nice um, example. Are there questions about this? Mm -hmm. Well, if not, I want to announce that uh, the tutorial is actually next Wednesday evening. Okay, and then see you.